What if I told you that the world you see around you could be a mental construction, that it doesn't exist out there independently from you, but is a complex and perfect reconstruction that happens moment by moment inside your mind? Space, time, colors, even the solidity of objects you can touch could be merely perceptual tools, an interface created by your consciousness. This isn't the premise of a movie, but the heart of biocentrism, the revolutionary theory by Robert Lanza, defined by the New York Times as one of the three most important living scientists. Secondo la sua teoria, è la vita a creare l'universo, e non il contrario. Prepare for a journey that will dismantle the foundations of your reality, because you're about to discover that the observer is not a simple spectator, but the architect of the cosmos itself. If these questions fascinate you, and you want to explore the frontiers of science and knowledge, this is the channel for you. Subscribe to the channel and activate the bell. This is a little step for you, but it's very important for us. Thanks. Now, let's begin our journey. The theory of biocentrism completely overturns our vision of the cosmos. For centuries, science has taught us a precise model. The universe was born with the Big Bang, a collection of lifeless particles that, following predetermined laws, evolved until, by pure chance, life emerged on a small planet. In this vision, life is an accident of physics. Biocentrism instead proposes an idea as simple as it is radical. The universe emerges from life. It states that biology should be above other sciences to arrive at a true theory of everything. But what does it concretely mean that reality doesn't exist outside our consciousness? Let's start from the very process of perception. Consider everything that surrounds you at this moment. Language and common sense tell you that these things are out there in the external world. But think about it carefully. You cannot see anything through the bone of your skull. Every single experience you're having, the colors of this room, the shape of your body, the sound of my voice, is an active process that happens entirely inside your mind. Let's take sight. What we call light is only an electromagnetic phenomenon. It has by itself neither color nor brightness nor any visual characteristic. When these electromagnetic waves hit an object, for example, a piece of butter, they are reflected. Some of these waves enter our eye and hit the retina, where photoreceptors transform these small impulses of energy into electrical signals. These signals travel through complex neural cables to the back part of the brain. It's only there, in a network of trillions of cellular connections, that this raw information, which by itself has no color, is processed and appears to our consciousness as an image, as a yellow block of butter with a certain taste and consistency. The butter you perceive, therefore, exists only in your mind. It's the only place where the image is physically located. This logic applies to everything. We see the blue sky, but the cells of our brain could be modified to make it appear green or red to us. We perceive a certain temperature, but for a tropical bird, the same temperature would feel cold. Space and time, therefore, are not external and objective containers, but are the tools of our mental software to organize and make sense of this flow of information. All our experience is information that takes shape within our consciousness. This idea, which may seem purely philosophical, has its roots in the greatest mysteries of quantum physics. What happens, in fact, to the world when we're not observing it? If at night you turn off the light and leave the kitchen, you think that the refrigerator, the table, and the chairs are still there, invisible, right? Well, quantum physics tells us something shocking. At a fundamental level, all those objects are composed of a swarm of energy. Experiments like the double-slit experiment demonstrate that none of these particles exists in a defined place until it is observed. Instead, they exist as probability waves, like shadows scattered in space. They don't have a defined physical reality, nor a precise position. It's only at the moment when an observer interacts with them, when you return to the kitchen to drink a glass of water, that the mind, in fact, 
collapses these probabilities into a defined particle, into a solid object. Already at the beginning of the 20th century, scientists like Niels Bohr clashed with experiments that challenged common sense. In his legendary debates with Albert Einstein, who defended the idea of a real and objective universe out there, Bohr maintained that when we measure something, we're not discovering a pre-existing property, but we're forcing an indeterminate world to assume a value. In other words, we're not measuring the world, we're creating it. The double-slit experiment is the most famous proof of this. When scientists observe a particle, it behaves like a projectile and passes through only one slit. But if they don't observe it, it behaves like a wave and passes through both simultaneously. Why should the behavior of a particle depend on our observation? The answer, according to biocentrism, is that reality is a process that requires the participation of consciousness. Increasingly sophisticated experiments have revealed an even more incredible detail. The mere knowledge in the experimenter's mind is sufficient to cause the collapse of the wave function and transform a probability into a reality. But how can consciousness, something we perceive as immaterial, have such a fundamental role in the structure of reality? Here the theory goes even further, connecting quantum physics to the cognitive mechanisms of our brain. Scientists like anesthesiologist Stuart Hameroff and Nobel Prize winning physicist Roger Penrose have hypothesized that the human brain can be considered a sort of quantum computer. Consciousness, according to them, would not be a simple product of the electrical activity of neurons, but a more fundamental quantum process that takes place at a deeper level within protein structures called microtubules, which form the skeleton of each of our cells. In this vision, consciousness is like software that processes information at the quantum level. This same quantum information collected and processed is what we could call soul. Thanks to these principles, biocentrism offers an elegant explanation to one of cosmology's greatest enigmas. Why does the universe seem so perfectly tuned for life? There are more than 200 physical parameters, like the force of gravity or the charge of the electron, which if they were even slightly different, life as we know it could not exist. If the Big Bang had been a millionth of a time more powerful, the universe would have expanded too fast to form galaxies. If the strong nuclear force had been a bit weaker, only hydrogen would exist. The traditional explanations are two, either a divine creator or the multiverse, where infinite universes coexist and we find ourselves in the right one. Biocentrism proposes a third way. The universe couldn't exist in a way that doesn't allow life because life itself, the observer, determines its laws and parameters. The universe we see simply reflects the space-time logic of our consciousness. At this point, you might feel the need to delve deeper into these revolutionary ideas. The implications of this theory are profound. If space and time are not absolute, but tools of the mind, then death loses its meaning as an absolute end. Lanza compares consciousness to an energy that cannot be created nor destroyed. When the physical body dies, this energy doesn't vanish, but could simply transit into another reality, into one of the many parallel universes hypothesized by quantum physics. Death, therefore, would not be an end, but a transition, the quantum information that constitutes us, according to Hameroff and Penrose, would be released and returned to the universe to continue existing. Naturally, it's fundamental to be clear. Biocentrism and the Orch-OR theory are not, today, scientific theories accepted by the majority of the scientific community. They are bold and fascinating interpretations of quantum phenomena, but they remain subjects of debate for conventional physics and biology. Many scientists consider them more philosophy than science, since some of their claims are difficult, if not impossible, to test experimentally with current technology. Our reality at the quantum level behaves in a non-intuitive way, 
But the logical leap to affirm that consciousness creates the universe is a step that most scientists are not yet willing to take. In conclusion, what does this journey to the borders of science leave us with? It leaves us with a profound sense of wonder and with more questions than answers. Robert Lanza's theory of biocentrism, together with the ideas of scientists like Penrose and Hameroff, forces us to confront the limits of our understanding. It pushes us to ask ourselves if reality is really as it appears, or if the external world is, in a certain sense, a fantasy created by our mind. Perhaps science and spirituality, long seen as irreconcilable fields, are slowly converging toward a new paradigm, a unified system in which consciousness is not an accidental byproduct of the universe, but its very source. Perhaps, as Einstein suggested, the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubborn illusion, and our existence is not confined to time, but extends beyond it. We don't have certainties, but we have an invitation to look at the cosmos and ourselves with new eyes, to recognize that the greatest mystery is not out there among the stars, but within us, in the ineffable phenomenon of consciousness. Thank you for following this journey with us. If these topics excite you and you want to continue exploring together the great questions of existence, I invite you to subscribe to the channel. Let's continue to question ourselves, to explore and to marvel together.